שבוע טוב. I was just told that uh, your interest is that I will speak about uh, raising children. That's what I was just told. And before I was told to speak about something else, I'll try to mix it. <laughs> Everyone will be happy. Uh, yeah, yeah. First of all, I'm honored when, when uh, there is an event that is done for yeshiva, automatically I feel lucky that I have an opportunity to help even by one drop of a percent. Because uh, the most important mitzvah in this world, according to the Torah, is learning Torah. Where does it say it? Inside the Torah. It says that the covenant that Hashem made with the Jewish nation was for condi the condition that they will learn Torah around the clock. Im lo briti omam valayla, chukot shamayim va'aretz lo samti. And the future of the Jewish nation, it's their youth. That's where you have to put all the efforts because it's like planting seeds in the ground. If you put the seeds correctly, you take care of them correctly, then you have important people coming out. I had the school to speak in yeshiva one afternoon, and I really liked what I saw. Besides the great rabbis that give their life to raise the children in the right way, it's, uh, it's an opportunity, for, it's, it's unique. Most of yeshiva works in the same way, but over here it's unique. Because, you know, probably from what I've seen, these kids were not born in Bnei Brak or Mea Sha'arim or in the Rav of Rav Ovadia Yosef. They didn't. They come from houses that some of the parents are Baalei Tshuva or, you know, they, the parents themselves try to grow. So this is a double importance here. Very important. I would like to speak a little bit about the importance of raising children and comparing the secular world to the religious world. Everybody think, oh, the secular, secular world is full of problems, full of problems, crime, drugs, divorce, children are criminals on the street, but the religious world is an ideal, you know, everything is perfect, no problem, everyone is a big chacham. Unfortunately, I wish, I wish at least half of it would be true. But the situation that we are dealing with today, that both societies have similar sicknesses, very similar. Of course, by the religious people, you don't hear about it as often as the other world, but I promise you that there are sicknesses that need to be corrected. And that's why it's very important today to invest in our future, in the future of our children, because if we're not doing it now, in five, six, seven years from now when we wake up, it will cost us a million times more to correct things. And that's what parents don't understand. But let's go first to step number one. What is the most common problems of raising children? I'm talking now decent parents, <laughs> parents that understand about education, understand that the future of not only their family, the future of the Jewish nation is raising the children in a proper way. What's the most important, what's the most common mistakes that parents do? The answer, and that's in both worlds. This is parallel mistakes in both different, in different tracks, the religious and the non-religious. The parents, from the minute their children begin to walk and to talk, they already designed their life of their children, their future, according to their wishes. Which means, by the non-religious world, every parent is dreaming that his son will be a doctor, a lawyer, a successful businessman, uh, with the best college degrees, and that's where they push the kids over there. And not always the kids' purpose in life is to be one of the above. And then it creates a lot of pressure on the kids, and later, when they come to a certain age, all the frustration and the, egg and the anger and the pressure that the parents were putting on them becomes an atomic bomb, it explodes, and then you begin to hear drugs, running away from home, rebelling against everything, long hair, earrings, tattoos, running away with the Goya, and the rest is history. You hear it and you see it all the time. The parents never believe. They say, what, what? We gave him a car. We gave him a lot of money. We gave him everything. Why did we ask that he will be a doctor? What's the problem? 
That's one mistake. By the religious people, it's a very similar mistake. Everybody is dreaming that his son will be Rav Yashiv. From the minute he walks, right away, pressure, tutors, this, that, and the boy, he, he grew up with such expectation, and when he's not able to compete with the stars in the yeshiva world, he loses all his confidence, and Hashem Irachem, he runs away from it, because it's too much pressure. Later, when he grows, he says, religion is not sweet. These parents and rabbis, they talk about how great is Judaism, how sweet it is. For me, it was very bad. I don't want to hear about it. They have such nightmares from that, because of the wrong pressure was put on them. Not everybody came to the world to be the biggest chacham. Our job is to educate our children, first of all, to be decent people. Rich or poor is not thanks to what they're going to be in college or how great they're going to be in yeshiva. No. Hashem decides for everyone how much money he's going to have in his lifetime before he was even created. Most people put all their efforts about this and in the end when they come to Shammai they'll be so disappointed for so much false efforts that they put into this materialistic success. They say, why did I kill myself for this if it was mine anyway? I'll give you an example what I mean. One poor man that did not eat for two days, starving. He walked and he looked for maybe somebody with mezuzah on his home. Maybe he's going to give me something to eat. That reminds me of a good joke that uh, one guy didn't have a mezuzah. So he comes to the rabbi. He says, Rabbi, you know, three times this month alone, robbers broke into my house. Three robberies in one month. The rabbi said, did you check your mezuzot? He said, no. He said, oh, why didn't you check your mezuzot? He said, because I don't have mezuzot. <laughs> oh, let me come see. He comes to his house, he says, there's no mezuzot. He said, don't worry. The problems are over. He puts the mezuzah in the door. And he said, no more robberies. A month later, the rabbi passed by. He said, no. He said, rabbi, come, come, quick, take the mezuzah off. Quick. He said, what? what's the problem? You had robberies? He said, no, no robberies. Worse. So what? He said, before I had mezuzah, nobody knocked on my door. Once I put mezuzah, 50 rabbis an hour. He <laughs> 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 yes, I have this, I have that. Do me a favor, bring the robbery three times a month. <laughs> I live with that. <laughs> so anyway, so this poor man, this poor man is starving. He saw a nice, beautiful house with mezuzah. He knocked on the door. A fancy man opened the door. Yes, can I help you? He said, Food, food, I'm dying, food, give me something to eat. He said, oh, of course, I'll let you eat tonight like you never ate in your life. So, oh, thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. So, wait a minute, you know, in the business world, nothing is for free. All you have to do is to work for me two hours, and I'll give you the best meal in your life. He said, two hours to do what? He said, come, come, I'll show you my garage. He takes him down to the garage. It's all dust. Nobody ever cleaned the place. Move these boxes. Move it. Forget it. What a, what a job. So if I'll make it two hours, by then I'll be dead. Do I have a choice? I want to eat. After two hours he worked, he killed himself. He said, okay, two hours is gone. The garage is, became a pharmacy. Now give me food. He said, no problem. I keep my promise. Go across the street. See over there the door? Go inside, there is a table set for you, beautiful table like here. You eat as much as you want, drink as much as you want, you can put some in your pockets, and you can go. He runs quickly, he opens the door, he see beautiful meal. He eats, 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 after an hour that he's stuffed, he's about to leave. Somebody from upstairs say, I never saw in my life such an ungrateful person like you. He looks up. He said, what do you mean, ungrateful? He said, you ate so much? You're about to leave without even saying thank you? We're not asking from you for money or anything. No thank you? So he said, thank you? You have the nerve to tell me that I'm a chatsuf? You killed me for this food. He said, I'll kill you for the food? What are you talking about? We give food for every poor person for free. This is a bet tamchui. <laughs> Everyone who wants to eat comes here to eat for free for years. So what do you mean? I was, I was walking across the street. Oh, he fooled you also. <laughs> this guy, Hashem Rachem.
<laughs> when people knock on his door, that's what he does. This is the story. What's behind that? Every story has a message. What's the message? This world is betamchui. The world, everything is for free. You can do, you can take and enjoy, and Hashem give you as much as you want. But, but, some people want to get it with their own efforts. What's yours, you're going to earn it. What do you mean? It's mine. What, if I wouldn't work, Hashem wouldn't give me to eat. The people who work less, usually in this country, make more than the people who kill themselves 12 hours a day. You know, how many people kill themselves in physical work 12 hours a day, and they won't even make $100 a day, and some people make five, six phone calls a week, and they make millions of dollars, sell helicopters, you know, boats, great commission, sell a $15 million house, get 6%, finish. He's, he's already made more than this guy making 20 years. Efforts in work is not an indication of making money. And the parents that push their kids to some kind of direction because they plan for them to be wealthy, yeah, maybe they will be, but they break their spirit and they take away all the real talent that they have. We don't have permission to put goals for our children, what we want them to be. All we have to do is to raise them as decent human beings. We have to teach them Torah and Judaism. We have to teach them about Hashem. We have to teach them that the Torah is real, and we have to make sure that the rabbis that we put them by, they are kosher people and they know the job. Because sometimes a person wants to help very much, but he doesn't know the job. That's why it's very important which rabbi can feed that boy. I'll tell you a story that you understand what I'm talking about. One rabbi called up a son, a father, and said, you know, we have a problem with your son. He disturbed the whole yeshiva. You know, nobody learns. He sits, he, he's a clown. He dances, he makes noise. We're begging him to, to be quiet, to learn. He's not interested to learn. We put all our life into, his, into this kid, and nothing is helping. From now on, you have to buy him that medicine. It's called Ritalin. <laughs> That's going to keep him focused. At least he's going to listen to the Rebbe. Otherwise, there's no chance. So the father said, what is this? Is it covered by the Israeli Kupat Cholim, by the Israeli Health Insurance? He said, no, it's private. It's 200 shekel. 200 shekel, I don't make a week. I'm in a kolel. I'm in yeshiva. He said, it's your problem, sir. Go collect funds, I don't care. Your son has to get this Ritalin. <laughs> Finally, he got the, the medicine. He said to the Rebbe, so what? I, I cannot give it to him. I leave very early in the morning. By the time I leave, he just get up after. Don't worry, give it to me, I'll give it to him. So if you give it to him, the whole school would know that he takes this medicine. I'm not interested. He said, don't worry, I'm not a fool. I'm going to give it to him in a way that nobody will know. I'll send him after the davening every morning to make me coffee. And then I tell him it's inside the closet. Every day when you make me coffee, you take one pill and everyone will be happy. That's how it is. After a week, the father didn't get any phone call. No complaints, no nothing. So he said, the father said, really? It was worth 200 shekel. But he's afraid to ask his son. Another week, no phone call. Before, every day, three phone calls. But I already see the telephone number from Yeshiva. His heart <laughs> become pieces already. After three weeks, so it's too good to believe. He comes to his son, Yankale, how's school? He said, great, Abba. You're learning good? Say, great, I can tell you the whole Gemara by heart. You know the Gemara by heart? Before you didn't know one line. So I can tell you the Gemara with Rashi and Tosfot and the Navi <laughs> that connects to this. And Rabbi, the, the father said, what? 200 shekel? I was stingy about I should buy 200 million dollars for this medicine. Another week, then he said, oh, something is fishy here. Cannot be. He called up the, the Rebbe. He said, Rabbi, how's school? He said, Baruch Hashem, everything good. He said, my son is good, he's learning. He said, your son is an angel. And the class, everyone is happy. <coughs> so he comes to his son, he says, Yaakov, so you're taking the medicine every day? He said, what do you mean I'm taking the medicine? Every day I make him coffee, I put one pill in his coffee. <laughs>
What was the end of it? That's a true story. It's not a joke. This has really happened in reality. It happened in Israel. <laughs> once, once he started to take the pill, he became the best in the world. The great things about Rebbe is, is to know to admit when they also make mistakes. Yeah, they're better than the kids. They know better. They know what to do. But this is what's great about education. When the boy see that the Rebbe is an honest man, it's more important than a thousand pages of Gemara. Same thing with his father. If the father gives him beautiful speeches about praying, and every time Mincha comes, or oh, Mincha again, and he goes like this with a set face, or get up in the morning, one picture is like a million words. You can give him beautiful speeches. If you don't behave like according to your speeches, it won't help. And many other examples in life. For instance, the Rav gave before me a story about Rav Elchanan Wasserman. When the rich, people came, which rich person came and he made the kitchen dirty. He didn't want to come from the front. And he said, no, 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 go and come from the front. Make the rug as dirty as possible. Why? I don't want my kids to get the impression that rich people are more important than people who know Torah. That's not what Hashem said. Hashem said there's nothing to compare between wealthy people to someone who is wealthy with knowledge in Torah. Nothing to compare. They're not even in the same world. There's nothing to compare. Even a person who sponsors Torah, which is a great thing, because he gets a reward for every word of Torah he say thanks to his money. Then already is somebody that is very rich with mitzvot, but someone who, has not, someone who gives money to Torah, when he comes into the room, you have to rise? No. You have to like him, you have to appreciate his mitzvot. Someone who knows Torah, even a little kid, even a kid, when Rav Ovadi Yosef was a kid, Gdol Ador got up for him. He came to a place, he was 16, 17 years old. He got up. The Ashkenazim couldn't believe. How the Rav get up in the middle of Shabbat, Suda Shlishi, he said, that's going to be Gdol Ador. He was talking to him in learning. He rise for him. To give you an idea, what's the power of the Torah? So anyway, going back to our children, one of the most important things is to give the children a lot of love. And this is unconditional love. You don't give them love only when they're successful. You don't only give them love when they do what you want them to do. When you agree to go to that uh, college, or when you agree to go to that uh, path, or you want him to play piano and he agree even though he didn't want. No. You have to give him this love even when you think that this, compared to other, the other children, is the most failure one. Because in the long run, you have no idea what can turn. Sometimes the kids that look that they are the slowest, in the end, they bring much more pleasure and, and joys to their parents. And it's very common that it happens. Those who are stars when they're young, and those who are not so great, people need patience. The kid can be nothing special until 18 years old, then he mature. Everything that he heard around, in one minute comes out. So you have to remember, the most important thing is to show the kids that you love them no matter what. I'll give you an example. I had my oldest son, today he's 15. When he was a kid, I think he was pre-1A or first grade or maybe second grade, somewhere down there when he was six, seven years old. The, the Rebbe called and said, yes, problem with reading. And the Rebbe said, I'm very surprised because he's a very smart boy. And he's behind the class in reading. He makes a lot of mistakes. He doesn't read properly. So he needs a tu you need a tutor. I say, a tutor? He say, yeah. How much a tutor cost a man? He said, $2,500. He has to sit with him every day, I don't know, an hour. Pay him, I don't know, $50 an hour. It adds up to a lot of money. He said, I'm very sorry. I don't think I have, besides all my seven tuitions, more abilities to pay right now. I'll see, maybe I can sit with him and teach him to read. After all, I read Hebrew. Let's see. Then I call up my rabbi in Israel. And my rabbi told me, if the boy is smart as you describe him, for sure he doesn't have problem with reading. He has problem with attention. The subconscious of the human mind does things even though your conscious does not want. I'll give you an example. When a person lies, he touches his nose a lot. Nobody, nobody intends to turn himself in. If he stands in front of the judge and he lies, or he gets nervous, or when he has no confidence, when he says something, he, he hides his mouth. He doesn't realize. Later he show him a video. Or if two people speak and a person comes and they don't like him, automatically, without realizing, they turn their shoulder forward 
both of them to close the entrance from that third person because they're not interested in enjoying the conversation. Or when a person is bored from the speaker, slowly, slowly he moves to the edge of the table and puts his hands in, on, his, on his knees, which is a sign that I'm, about, I'm dying to get out of here already, finish already. So he doesn't realize. Speaker that learns sign, a body language, you know, me, when I argue with all kinds of not religious people all the time, I need to know who to spend time on and who not to waste time on. Part of it is to see how they react with their bodies. Because what people say, they always say, ah, no, I'm not convinced, I'm not convinced. Sometimes they say, I'm not convinced, he's more convinced than me, he can give the lecture now. But it's the ego. Well, he's going to say in front of his whole family and his friends, you just convinced me that my whole life is one big mistake. So he continued to argue, and I know I'm going to waste another hour on him. Let's move to somebody who really wants to learn. He already knows. It's important to know. So you see that the conscious and the subconscious work differently. The conscious we control, the subconscious we're not aware of. Not, not necessarily we're aware of. So he told me, he has problems with attention. You give him a lot of attention? I said, listen, I'm so busy every night. I'm out of the house for seven, eight, ten hours. By the time he gets home, I leave right away. So between praying until he comes from yeshiva, I don't get to see him beside Shabbos. He said, listen, listen. You take him to a park, sit with him in a place quiet. This is what you have to tell him. This is like amazing, an, an advice which took five minutes, it didn't cost a penny. He said, hug him and tell him, you know I love you the most in the world. And I don't even care if you're going to be the smartest in the class. I don't even care if you're going to know how to read or not. As far as I'm concerned, no problem. If you try, if you do your best and you did not succeed, and you succeed, for me it's the same. What do I care? You're my son, I love you. You think I love you because what you're going to be? Whatever you're going to be, you're still the most important thing for me in the world. And I want you to know it, and don't feel any pressure about reading. If they tell you don't have to read, this, that, don't worry about it. For me, you are the best. That's all. Just show him that you love him. <laughs> Not even a week. Two days later, the Rav called. I don't understand. I let him read today. Big surprise. He read the whole thing without one mistake. Person does. It's called negative attention. Things that they do is to get love. But we owe them. As parents, we owe them this love. But sometimes we're so busy. One father was a very, very busy businessman. Every time his son comes to show him his hundred that he got on a test. Not now, I'm busy. Now, now. It's 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Every evening he comes from the office at 6, 6.30. From the minute he gets home, even time to eat he doesn't have. He's on the phones, this deal, that deal, conference call, fax, emails. One time the son comes to him and says, Abba, just one minute, I show you the test. He says, okay, okay, another 10 minutes. I'm busy now, You're disturbing me. 10 minutes later he gets a phone call. He doesn't recognize the number. He picks up the phone. Abba, who is this? Your son. You were just here. Where are you calling me from? I'm calling you from the neighbor across the street. What happened? Everything okay? Yeah, yeah. I went to the neighbor to call you. But why? You were here. He said, I realize the only way to talk to you is on the phone. You understand? That father at least learned his message. He learned his lesson in life. But are we better than that father? We're all busy. It's always going to be something you're busy about. This, that, that. We're busy with doing chesed for the whole world. And the last thing on the list is the wife and the children. And I tell you something that my rabbi told me in the name of the biggest chacham in the world that passed away 12 years ago. Not only the biggest chacham, the biggest kabbalist that we had in the last 20 years. Rabbi Ben Zion, Abba Shaul. This is what he said to him, and he transferred the message to me. He said to me, how many nights you go to give lecture? I say, almost every night. So it's a mistake. Just go two nights a week, that's it. The rest, you stay home. I say, oh, well, I'm going to cancel all the lectures. Every night, few more Jews become religious. This is before the internet was in place. It was only the people who come that night, before the internet. But still, every night, few people. He told me, no, no, it's not a mitzvah. I said, what do you mean? To save souls is the biggest mitzvah. The Zohar speaks about it, the Gemara, the Torah. How can you say, so I'm telling you in the name of the biggest chacham in the world. It's not my opinion. 
If you do the biggest mitzvot in the world, and it, your wife and your children pay the price and they're not happy about it, not only it's not mitzvot for you, it will kind 100% sins for you. First, you have to put all your efforts and life into your wife and children in a house, and then after they agree, and they release you from some obligations, that's a different story. Now it's with bracha. And I took his advice, and then later on, he gets to a point that the wife sometimes realizes already that now it's time to put some more efforts and cover for the husband, and things started to work much better. And this is it. We put so much efforts in other people, and we forget on, on our own children. And remember, the most important thing is an example. We know, you know, Hashem tests us how much we put in the family. Not always we're going to be successful. We find an example that Yitzchak, Yitzchak, right? Who was his sons? How did Yitzchak have a son like Esav? It's a negative example throughout history. Esav. Who came out of him? Amalek, the Nazim, all the negative in the world. In reality, came from Yitzchak. Ma, Yitzchak didn't know how to raise children. At the same time, he had the most righteous person, perhaps in history, Yaakov, the founder of Jewish, of, of Jewish, of the Jewish nation, Israel. His name was changed to Israel from the same father. Sometimes you put all your life, and Hashem has His own plans. Sometimes, when a father is a great example and a role model or he could be a great rabbi, or he knows a lot about children education, and one of the most important people in children education that have two sons that barely religious. Why is it? Because sometimes Hashem said there's a soul that needs a lot of love and caring. Where will I reincarnate that soul? Where? To a pushtak from the market that all day lie and cheat and mechalel Shabbat? Where am I, I going to put this kid? If I put him over there, there's no point of sending him back to the world. Let's send it to this beautiful family when the father gives his life. Like this, if he still goes his way, when he finishes this term in life, he cannot have any excuses. Previous life, he came to me in his trial and said, Oh, of course, look where all my parents were. Look where I grew up. Look what public school they sent me to. Why do you expect me not, not to be a sav? Of course I'll be a sav. Ah, but now when your parents were the best in the world, so that, that's why not always is the parents' fault. A person cannot sit and cry 20 years, it's my fault, it's my fault. But when it becomes for sure the parents' fault, for sure, when they give too much to the kids, materialistic toys, too much, this game, that game, 16 right away car, a, a, a birthday every year, a new watch, new this, new bedroom, he has two kids, a house with 20 rooms, each kid has three bedrooms. Who said it's good? Ah, show off. You're going to pay so much for that show off. What, what, what does it mean you? All of us. We're going to pay so much for that show off one day. Because if you open up your eyes and see the kids that turn to be the best kids in this generation, who are those kids? Kids that grew up in wealthy lifestyle, or kids who grew up with almost nothing. I'm not saying completely to starve. No, that's also not good. Then God forbid they can turn also into stealing and other things when they need there's necessity. The Gemara asks, what's better to be rich, poor, or in between, in the middle? The Gemara says, not good to be rich, not good to be poor, good to be average, to be average. One of the Rebbes in Erev Rosh Hashanah, he said, I felt that my soul went up to heaven, and I heard an angel is begging Hashem to give the Jewish nation a great ear. A great ear. What great ear? Give every Jew tons of money, tons of parnasa, lots of success, more than ever in history. So all the Jews in the synagogue said, great, who is this great angel? He said, Malach Amavet, the angel of death. And they say, why the angel of death loves us so much? He said, he knows the best way that his job gets done fast is when Hashem gives the Jews too much, what happened? The Torah says, Vaishman Yeshurun Vaivat. We become a little bit heavy and heavy and heavy and style and this and another jewelry and another car every six months and uh, three houses and he doesn't know where to go first for Shabbat and all that. Thank you very much. 
I already made bracha there, so. So what do we see here? That the more a person gets it, the more he is connected to it, the more he depends on it, he cannot live without it. There's no sin to be wealthy, don't get me wrong. It's also not a crime to drive a good car that drives you around without being stuck on the road, or to dress in a proper way. It's no problem. None of don't get the wrong idea here. You know where the problem begins? When you cannot live without it. It becomes an addiction. Just like drugs. A person smokes a cigarette one every ten years. No, everybody understands. It's not an addiction. No, once in ten years we allow you to cheat. But if every, if every 30 seconds he lights a cigarette from another, everybody knows he's addicted. You know? People say, Rabbi, what's all these drugs? You keep talking against it, against it. It's, we're not really using having drugs, all the, the young guys. We're not really using heavy drugs. It's only smoking. I say, you fools, all these people who their life is already destroyed 20 times, how did they start? <laughs> also with smoking. They also used to speak like you. What do you think? Right away they went to destroy their life with $300 a day drugs? I had one very rich guy from Canada. He told me, I have to come see you. I said, okay, when are you coming to New York? He said, tell me your address, I'll drive. So you're going to drive? He said, don't worry, in four hours I'll be by you. I said, four hours? It's seven, eight hours drive. He said, no, I have a Ferrari. I fly. <laughs> I said, okay, I give him the address. Then on the phone, I said, what do you want to talk to me about, that you're willing to drive from Canada? He said, I have a serious problem, and uh, maybe you can help me, and maybe I can help you. I said, okay. So he said, you want to talk a little bit on the phone to give me an idea? He said, listen, I'm being, I'm being a very heavy user of drugs. For 30 years, I use cocaine, he says to me. For 30 years. God was good to me. He gave me so much money. I own a multi-level marketing company and I'm the head of the pyramid. So I make money of like 3,000 people under me. Everything they do, I make money from them. So I don't have to worry about money. I have money coming to me every minute. So God has been good to me. He says to me on the phone, I'll never forget this. That he gave me so much money that I can afford to use the best drugs and the best doctors. <laughs> You understand how a mind of a person can be twisted? God has been good to me. If he was clever, he should have begged God to take away all his money. If ever, if he can ever one day get out of his addiction, is by taking away his money. But this is us. Not only addiction to drugs is an addiction. I see sometimes in a yeshiva, kids go with hundreds of dollars in their pocket. 13, 14 years old. Hundreds of dollars in her pocket. Why? Because his father is wealthy is a good idea to give him hundreds of dollars every day that he will have in his pocket. Mm -hmm. And he takes it out in front of all the kids, he begins to count. Some kids that don't have money, they're jealous, and it creates problem. One other thing I've seen, kids come, they, when they want to talk to each other, they check what kind of tie they have. They flip the tie, ah. I'm not talking not religious kids. Not religious kids, it's not their fault. What can you blame them for? Nobody ever taught the Musar. They ever heard about Ramchal, Mesilat Yisharim. What? Sharet Tshuva? They ever heard about some kind of Musar? There's no Musar. The goal is to be successful. That's all in their life. That's what the parents teach them. That's the direction. Just to be successful and make sure not to get caught doing something wrong. That's it. But kids that learn Musar, he checks the tie. He checks what kind of new game came out. He has the new game, doesn't have the new game. These kids, are, where are the future? Where are they get to? Where? They're already, already very deep in this situation. You have to know one thing. We have big, strong ashgacha in everything we do in life. The higher a person gets in his level, in his spiritual level, he has siata dishmaya, special help from Hashem to see all the miracles that Hashem does to him. I'm going to tell you two short stories, and with that we're going to finish Bezrat Hashem. I don't know the rest of the plan tonight, and then if you have questions, I will be happy to answer. But the first story that happens to me, now remember, the reason I tell you this story is because I want to educate each one of us to see that if we have a diary, and we write the miracles that Hashem does to us every day, 
will be very, very amazed once they hear to read in this diary and say, how much God loved me. Look what He has done for me. Now, don't translate the miracles by how much money you made. Or, or you were supposed to go to jail and in the end you didn't. That's also a big miracle. A miracle can be even making $20. But the question is, how did you make it? Sometimes you can make $2 million. It's a small miracle because it has a lot to do with nature. Or after all, you put time and efforts and you educate it. So maybe it's nature. But sometimes you get $20 in such a way that there's no doubt that Hashem took His hand from heaven and just put it in your hand. I'll give you an example. I come home one day. I see my wife is on the phone with a credit card in her hand. And I said, that's a unique situation. Baruch Hashem, by me it's unique. I said, if my wife is holding a credit card, I wonder what she's buying. So I'm curious. <laughs> so I say to her, what are you ordering? So she said, we ran out of checks. I didn't suspect for a minute that she has a, a, some kind of desire to buy another, I don't know, bracelet or something like this. Baruch Hashem, over the years we educate ourselves just to do what's really important. All the extras we try to clean out of our life. So she said, we need checks. We're running out of checks. The last checkbook. I said, okay, so what are you ordering? She said, we have to order 350 checks. I said, how much? She said, $84. I said, $84 for, for 350 checks? We ordered last time 1,000 checks for $20. She said, yeah, but that was three years ago. I said, but what? The price became 10 times more expensive in three years. I have a feeling that it's, it's she said, we're ordering from the same company. I said, give me a minute, let me check. I come to the computer. I put in Google, printing checks. You can go home later and check. Printing checks. Maybe 10,000 telephone numbers came out. Every other person in America that has a computer and a printer, prints checks. Send him avoid the check, he makes you checks. Now, that's it. It's, you don't need a professional for that. I'm saying to myself, well, I'm going to have time to start reviewing 10,000 pages. I say, Hashem, help me out. Let me get one of them. Let me get one of them. That's why the way it will be a normal price. We order and finish with that. So I say, let's go on this one. I, pre I pick that one. I see an 800 number. First I check. I see very good. It says 600 check for 30, $37. 600. So it's a quarter of a price. I say, ah, that's enough. No need to check anymore. Let's order from them. I call up the 800 number. Somebody, American guy, picked up the phone. He said, hello, if, uh, for sales, press one. I press one. He picks up the phone. I say, excuse me, sir, I, I saw in your page that you're selling 600 checks for $37. Can I order it? He said, yes. I say, is that include shipping or not? He said, no, not include shipping. I said, probably now shipping another $30. <laughs> it will be the same. So I say, so how much is the shipping? He said, depend to where. I say, Monsi, New York. He say, where in Muncie? <laughs> <laughs> where in Muncie? Now, I don't know who is this guy. I'm not going to give my exact address now. I say, Nelson, corner of Highview. He say, oh, there's no shipping. Just come tonight to Rav Schlesinger Shure at 8.30 and I'll bring you the box. <laughs> It's already a good story, but it gets much better, wait. <laughs> it's already a good story, no? From 10,000 numbers. I say, why? You live in Muncie? He say, yes. I say, where in Muncie? He say, on Bates Drive. I say, Bates Drive? I used to live in Bates Drive. What number? <laughs> Can you believe it? He lives where I used to live? How many people we have in the United States? 400 million people? 10,000 companies, at least. Thousands of pages. I said, let's pick up one. Who is he? A guy that lives where I used to live. The next day I went there, I picked up the checks. You understand? This is an Ashgar. This has happened with me. Now I'll tell you another story. 35 years after the Holocaust, a rabbi and his wife was asked to come to Brooklyn, New York, to revive a synagogue that was about to close. The condition in the synagogue wasn't so great. Everything broken and all. They need to start raising funds and renovate the place. The rabbi came. He said, you know what? We have a few days until Purim. Let's do our best at least to clean the place. And we can do a Purim party. 
And then maybe in Purim party you'll be able to raise funds. As they're cleaning the place, a snowstorm started. Big bunch of snow fell and made a hole on the side of the synagogue, in a, in a, in a wall. He knocked down a part of the wall. So the rabbi said, what am I going to do? There's a hole now until we bring somebody to, to build it. He's thinking what to do. On the way home he walks. He sees a flea market. Because of the snowstorm, they folding the flea market. So he saw one person sell tablecloth, big nice tablecloths. He saw one with Star David right in the middle. Magen David, right in the middle. He said, how much is this? He says, eh, it's very old. I don't know, whatever, $10, $20. Right away he bought it. He said, I'm going to cover the hole in the wall. Let me stick it like this on the wall. Until after Purim, we'll fix the wall. But in the meantime, we close it with this thick tablecloth. He puts the tablecloth on. Then comes Purim party. But the day of Purim party, an old woman comes, and it's still snowing. She said, can I hide inside the shul? It's too much snow right now. Can I stay 10, 10 20 minutes to sit here? She walks in, as she's bored there, she looks at the place, she says, tell me, this tablecloth, can you check in the back on the right there if there is a E, L, M initials? Wow. He say, what do you mean? She said, go all the way in the right, climb on it, see or, flip it over, see if there's initials. She said, well, I used to live in Poland before the Nazis came. And I remember that I own that. That used to be mine in Poland. How, well, and it's very rare to get such a thing. It's very unique with the design. Check! He goes, he flips it over, her initials. She said, it's mine. I used to own it. The Nazis came. They kicked that out of our house. They took my husband away. I never saw my husband ever again. And they took my house away. And that's it. I was in a forest. I, I, I hid in a sewer. Some of the Jews, bank managers, Big doctors, big judges, how do you think they got saved? They lived three years in a sewer with the bathroom of the goyim and the rats. Three years they were hiding inside the sewer. Three years, yesterday he lived in a 15 million dollar mansion, the Nazis came, he escaped, he took whatever he could and he hid in the sewer. Imagine living in a sewer three years with your children and wife. So this is what happened. Overnight Hashem turned it around. So now he said, the rabbi say, okay, so if it's yours, I feel bad keeping it here. You, you, you feel free to take it. She said, no, no, it's my honor to donate it to a synagogue. But I'm so happy to see something that is to be mine in Poland. Purim party came. All the people were invited. Oh, so now the rabbi told her, where do you live? She said, I live in Staten Island. What are you doing here? I'm working in cleaning. An old woman, she cleaned places. So he said to her, how do you go to Staten Island? She said, I'm taking a bus, whatever. But uh, I hope that they have transportation. He said, okay. the, the minimum I can do for you is give you a ride from Brooklyn to Staten Island. We have time until the evening. Let me give you a ride home. He gives her a ride home. He puts her in her home. He felt he did a great mitzvah. Then he comes back. The Purim party started. People came to meet the new rabbi. One old man, by the end of the party, is sitting and staring on this tablecloth. He said to him, this tablecloth, my wife used to have a tablecloth like this in, in uh, Poland. It's too much, it's too similar. doesn't make sense there's more than one like this. So I say to him, uh, your wife, uh, you know, what's with her? He said, I don't know, one day the Nazis came, they took me to a working camp. And from that moment on, by the time I came back one day to the house, I was already going there. I never saw her ever again. I say, you feel like taking a drive somewhere? He said to him, <laughs> 12 o'clock at night. He said, to where? He said, come, I have a nice surprise for you. Took the old man, they drove, they wake her up. She comes, she sees her husband over there. True story that happened. In the 70s, 35 years after the war, they didn't see each other. 35 years. There are so many stories like this about Hashgacha, and we're going to think that Hashem is not watching what we do. Everything we do has been registered. Ayn Roa. Imagine if she didn't want to donate that to the shul. That's it. She would never see him. Because he would not recognize it. It's all connected. One little thing you do and Hashem opens you the world. I want to finish and then I'll give you time for questions. 
I wasn't asked by the yeshiva, but I feel it's an obligation as a Jew. I want to encourage every person who sits here who has the ability to help Torah. First, you help yourself. Don't ever forget this. This is what Hashem says in the Torah. Gadol ha-me'aseh yoter min When you make people learn Torah, thanks to your money, the Torah that they learn, you get a greater reward from them. Yeah, they know more Torah than you. But if you have another one, and another one, and it's 20, and it's 30, and plus some of these kids, if without this great yeshiva, who knows where they would be? It's not only yeshiva, it's atzalat nefashot. I don't have to tell you what atzalat nefashot means. To save one soul of a person, it's already, the Zohar said, it's worth it to suffer 70 years running around in this world just to save one soul. Needless to say, 10, 20, 50, or 100. So everyone who ha he has any ability, this is, a, this is, it's called in Hebrew, Tzav Asha'a. When there's no one that can do, and I can do, I must do it. I, have no, I don't have that much of a choice. So Bezrat Hashem, I hope that this, you know, this great family that opened up this nice house for everyone to come, and I'm sure they do it from all their hearts, otherwise what's the point? So, Bezrat Hashem, I just hope to hear from Rav Neri and from, the, from all the staff here that uh, the yeshiva is keep going and the yeshiva is able to pay for what they need to pay because if there's no flower, there's no Torah. If there's no Torah, there's no flower, of course. But if there's no Zvulun, there's no Issachar. Bezrat Hashem, not only that the yeshiva has to maintain and to go, Bezrat Hashem to grow and to have more people. And to always, and we all have to, if a person stands in the same place, it's like dead. It's finished, it's, it's tikkun. You have to always progress. Each one of us, us, the yeshiva, always have to grow and progress more and more and more. The yeshiva of Lakewood started with, with 60, 70 people in the first year. Now it's 6,000 people. Yeah, right? When a person starts something, you never know where it's going to get. So Bezrat Hashem, like I said, the future of our children is the Torah. And I'm, uh, I allow myself to steal two more minutes of your time to tell you about yeshiva and sponsoring a person who learns in yeshiva, a story that happened to me. It's probably already famous, some of you maybe heard it. But I went to give a lecture in uh, Hillcrest. I used to give the, uh, lectures in the uh, kindergarten over there of Bella, if you know her. She have uh, in Hillcrest over there, and her daughter Orly, she was with her husband Shachar, were making me the lectures in that time. And one time I met a girl there named Regina, very nice girl, Ashkenazi American, from Russian background. Red hair, she comes to me, I think she was 20 years old, first time I saw her in a lecture. Maybe you can find me Shiduch from one sea, I'm, I'm interested in a person who learns Torah seriously. So I told her, okay, give me your information. If I find someone for you, maybe I'll let you know. Next time I came there three months later, Orly was telling me, you know, my friend Regina wanted to come, but she cannot come. Why? She just got married. It's the Sheva Brachot, whatever. I said, oh, she got married. Mazal Tov. How did she get married? She tells me. How, do you want to hear how did she get married? I said, how did she get married? What does it mean, how did she get married? She found the Shiduch and got married. I felt right away there's something special here. So I say, yeah, how did you get married? Now there's, um, I don't know, maybe a hundred people there, 70 people. They're all not religious. None of them religious. Guys and girls. So she say, yeah, I'll tell you how she got married. When she came with her parents from Russia, they were so poor. They came from Russia. They don't have money. They came to America, to New York. Their parents couldn't put her in yeshiva. So they didn't know what to do. They were about to send her to public school. So they went to a Russian organization that raised funds from Russian wealthy people and they used the money to send Russian kids to go to yeshiva. They say, we have a girl, we want to send her to yeshiva, we cannot afford. They say, give us some time, we'll find her a sponsor. They went to Mill Basin, they found a wealthy guy, a wealthy guy, Russian, not religious at all. Nothing, doesn't keep Shabbat, nothing. They told him, you want to pay few hundred dollars a month for this girl to send her to yeshiva? Or you let, you let her go to public and who knows what's going to come out of her? He thought about it and he said, okay, I'll sponsor her. He gave them the money for one year in advance. He puts her in yeshiva. She was a little kid. It needless to say, she says she never had money for, for the bus, for candy, nothing. She grew up like this all her life. Now one day she goes to a place 
a not religious girl comes to her and says, hi, nice to meet you. She saw that she's very religious. She says, yeah, nice to meet you. She says, I think I have a shidduch for you. So the religious Regina say to her, for me, you have a shidduch for me? She was surprised, what did she understand about shidduch bichlal? Not religious, this girl. She said, yes, my brother. She said, no, but I'm very religious. What your brother? She said, no, no, my brother is very religious. He was just in Or Sameach in Monsi for six months now. He came back, he wants a very religious girl. So she said, you sure? Okay, let me try. They went out. What happened in the end? Perfect shiduch. Now the parents of Regina, right, going to meet the, the parents of the guy. So they take them to a place, to a couple of old people. They come to the place, L'chaim, to meet the parents. The Shatchan brings them, the Shatchani, the girl, the, the daughter. She brings them into the house. Through the conversation, guess what they found out? The father of the guy is the person who was paying all her tuition over the years. <laughs> True story here, it's recorded, it's going to be all over the internet with names. You don't believe me? Go ask them. This is what happened. No! Something like this. Seven billion people in the world. It can be coincidence. The person who sponsored a girl to yeshiva prepared the future of his grand-grand-grandchildren for eternity with his own money. Nothing that you do for others, you do for them. You all do for you and for your children. Thank you very much. Shavua Tov. Good luck to everyone.